Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Trisha Morgan. I am the Managing Director of the Community Engagement Center here at Pitzer. It is my pleasure to be able to introduce you to uh, two really amazing uh, folks. Right now, I'm going to introduce you to Violet Luxton, um, who will continue the introduction for Julia. Um, Violet is a, a really phenomenal uh, person. She's somebody who is um, an alumna of Pitzer College and has been really involved and engaged in supporting Native initiatives and programs um, at Pitzer for many years, Violet. I don't know how many years, Violet, since you were a student <laughs> and then since then as an alumni, you were a staff in our office. Um, but anyway, um, and Violet also works with a number of um, folks in the community. And so I just am really appreciative of Violet for helping to put together this event and an amazing, amazing slate of speakers and a really great um, a project that she's working on, a little bit bigger project of which these workshops are a part of. Um, I'm hoping you can talk just a little bit about that, Violet, um, in, in your introduction. But anyway, that's it for me. And thanks so much. Um, and take it away. Thanks. Thank you, Trisha. Uh, that was a sweet introduction. And it has actually been seven years uh, that I've worked with the Community Engagement Center. And um, interesting story about how, how that started. Um, I uh, grew up as a third generation Chicana um, with my family coming out of East LA and Brawley and uh, also have Penobscot heritage on, on my father's side. And um, always really wanted to uh, connect to my heritage and, and really felt deeply inside um, the wisdom of my ancestors in that heritage, uh, but didn't necessarily have the tools to connect growing up in an urban environment and having my uh, traditional territory be all the way in the East Coast um, or in Mexico. And so um, one night I, I was watching an elder speak and you know, she said, if you have that native heritage and you have that, that connection and that blood in you, um, your ancestors are listening and you can go out and you can speak to them, talk to the stars, look up at the sky and ask them to show you your culture. And to be honest, that uh, something came over me and I said, you know what, I, you know, I'm just going to go do that. And I looked up at the sky and I still remember the stars and how they were twinkling in the night and uh, this was sophomore year at Pitzer and outside of my apartment, uh, sharing with my roommate. And I just uh, said, you know, uh, I'm ready to learn my culture. I'm, I'm ready to connect. I'm ready to work for my community um, and represent my, my ancestors. And within, gee, four weeks a month, um, I reconnected with uh, then uh, director of the Native Youth to College, Scott Scoggins. And it was like a, a, a beautiful snowball effect. Um, the next seven years, I, I kind of started as a volunteer and then just quickly, uh, worked my way up as a mentor and um, have, have worked with the Community Engagement Center for now, I, I think seven or eight years. Uh, so uh, I'm currently the student support specialist at Claremont Graduate University for the Institute of Mathematical Sciences and the Center for Information Systems and Technology. Um, but it, it all really started with Pitzer and I really want to grow the work that uh, we've all been able to do, Trisha and Scott and Eric um, at the Community Engagement Center with Elder Julia and, and make it a 7C coalition and, and really um, create support for native resources and our students here. Um, so that's a little bit more of kind of the professional background, but allow me to introduce myself uh, the way Auntie has taught me. Meha, Ekwaha, Aweshkomeha, Netwaniyane, Thakorhaki, Sarawak. Hello, I'm happy to be here. My name is Woman Who Speaks in Tongva, and I was named by Tongva elder Julia Bogany, who is about to speak. I have Penobscot heritage on my father's side from mm -hmm. Osha area and also European heritage and I have European heritage and First Nations heritage from Sinaloa in Mexico, particularly La Brecha and Wasave and also the state of La Paz. So maritime people 
And um, uh, my family migrated to East LA and Brawley and were farm workers. Um, and uh, that's kind of where I, I come from today. And I'm gonna introduce our amazing elder in residence and speaker today, Elder Julia, and share a little bit about her life and career before she shares with us today. So Elder Julia is a teacher. She's a cultural ambassador, an artist, a speaker, a mother, a grandmother, and a great grandmother. She's also a member of the indigenous Tongva tribe who are among the original inhabitants of the Los Angeles basin. Yet despite that, Julia feels that she and other native people in the region today are largely invisible. So for the past two decades, Julia has taken it as her mission to make the Tongva language and culture visible to the rest of society. These days, Julia is a Tongva cultural affairs director and an elder in residence at Pitzer College, advising students and leading workshops and discussions. When she has a break, which is seldom I can attest to, she often likes to come to the nearby Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Gardens. Next to the large oak tree, there is a replica of a Tongva village near where her great grandmother Rose once grew native and medicinal plants and taught Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Gardens founder, Susanna Bixby Bryant about their many uses. Many decades later, Julia is still teaching about those same plants to young Tongva children in their language. And I'd just like to welcome you to this second of three workshops. Um, just like the introduction for Elder Julia said, our ancestors have been providing knowledge and resources and teaching people on this land for thousands and thousands of years. And although the, the borders change, the place names change, uh, what they call us changes, um, our wisdom, our kinship relations, and our respect for the land hasn't changed. Uh, so these workshops are really meant to provide coping strategies for our current social conditions through that wisdom, that root that hasn't changed of indigenous culture. And uh, we're gonna hear about six indigenous women today and how uh, they were able to take on pandemics, take on colonization, take on really tumultuous times uh, so that we can have a little courage based off of what Tongva women have done and indigenous women have done in the past. And uh, please stay tuned for our next workshop. It's gonna be with musician and muralist, Joe Galarza, who did the sacred Yangna mural on Scott Hall and some of the murals in Scott Hall courtyard. And we're gonna be painting Scott Hall again with the Twin Sisters mural. So if you are an artist, have inspiration and would like to get involved, we really want your voice out there. So please, uh, we'll drop an email and contact in the chat and we'd love to hear from you. But without any uh, further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our elder in residence, Julia Bogany, for a blessing and uh, the introduction to our indigenous ancestors. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight and um, such a great elaborate <laughs> introduction. I'd like to start by first, um, so we don't have a circle, we have a square, um, saying, you know, uh, I welcome all of you and open to any questions you have and um, anything we'd like to share together. Uh, I don't know if we're gonna do like a introduction from everyone, small, short, something like who we are and your name. So I'm the culture officer for the Tongva of San Gabriel. And, um, and I've been at, at the Claremont Colleges for 13 years now, long time. <laughs> so anyways, so you wanna start, who's gonna name them all? Start introductions. And what you wanna hard. know, I guess, introduction and what you'd like to learn. And we can go popcorn style. Eric, uh, you're to my right, so. Uh... You're muted. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Eric Steinman. Um, I'm a descendant of Norwegian and German settlers who 
moved to uh, Sioux Territory in, uh, I grew up in the state of North, North Dakota and part of the uh, uh, Sioux Territory. And um, I teach sociology here at Pitzer. And I just love this idea. I'm so happy to learn about this series. It's so perfect. So I just want to say thank you for that. Oh, and uh, Nancy, you are to my, to my right. Would you like to follow? Sure, um, I'm Nancy Minty and I'm the Executive Director of Uncommon Good um, here in Claremont. We're a charity that works with uh, low-income children and their families. And we had the great, great privilege of meeting um, Julia and uh, uh, partnering with her and the Tongva tribe uh, to build our whole earth building uh, here, a first of its kind in the world green building um, that uh, tells the story and the history of the Tongva people. And I just love hearing uh, Julia tell her stories. I can never get enough of it. So that's why I'm here and I'm, I'm anxious to hear more. So, and I'm here with my husband, Arden. Um, you want to? <clears throat> Arden Alger. And I uh, am an alumni, I'm a retiree from JP College. I taught photography. I was the department chair. I was Senate president for 18 years, and it goes on and on. <laughs> and so I always like stories. That's, that's what visual things are for. And thank you for doing this. Oh, thank you, Nancy and Arden. And we'll drop a link to the whole Earth Building and Uncommon Good in the chat. So people who want to learn a little bit about that amazing history in Claremont uh, can do so. And I will uh, pass it to Trisha Morgan. You are to my right. Hi all, I'm Trisha Morgan again. I'm the Managing Director of the Community Engagement Center. I'm also an alumni of the college. I graduated in 2008. I was a new resources student. Um, go New Resources Students, or NRS, um, <clears throat> and I love Julia also. I love hearing from Julia and learning from her, so um, I, every time I do, I learn how much I don't know, um, and I'm also really excited to learn more, so thanks uh, for sharing with us, Julia. Oh, thank you, Trisha. And uh, Paula, are you there? Is that, is that you, sister? Paula. Hello. Um, I'm Paula. Um, I'm sorry, I missed what, what we're doing to introduce ourselves. Just, just a me. quick name, uh, if you want uh, kind of your school and some of the things you're interested in learning or talking about today. Yeah, um, so I'm Paola. Um, I go to Scripps College. Um, I'm from Oakland. Um, and I'm studying public health. And so one of the things that really interests me about this talk is um, the focus on healing. Um, and I feel like so much of um, our knowledge or what, what the common knowledge of health um, is so colonial and um, focused on um, Western ideas of what health is. Um, and so I'd love to learn um, more about different types of healing. Um, yeah. Thank you, sister. Happy you're here. Oh. And uh, Sarah Gilbert, I see uh, you in the lineup next. Would you like to introduce yourself, sister? <laughs> um, hi, uh, I'm Sarah Gilbert. I'm assistant professor of sculpture at Pitzer College. Um, I'm just back from medical leave. Prior to medical leave, um, I had the great pleasure of um, working with Julia um, in one of my courses to design uh, and make a, a sign for the talking circle, which I spent all day today actually drafting you an email that I hope to get out before this meeting, but didn't, so look for that <laughs> soon. Um, but anyway, I'm hoping to finally get that installed this semester, but more than that, I just, um, yeah, I, 
I went through a lot. I was hit by a car. I had some domestic violence issues. Um, it was a really tough couple of years um, in, that I've been gone for. And I, I, you know, even though I wasn't in touch with Julia, which I really regret, I wasn't able to at the time. Um, I really, uh, I thought about her a lot <laughs> and I thought a lot about um, her joy and generosity in the face of so much difficulty. And it was like a, an amazing source of strength for me and trying to work my way back um, to the land of the living. So I'm just grateful to be around her again and to hear anything she has to say about this moment and how we can better serve our students and each other and yeah, survive and thrive. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for doing this. We're happy you're here. And let's see. Florent, oh, uh, I see uh, Z Zion, is that right? Welcome. Yes, that's correct, uh, Zane. Zane. Um, I'm a, a professor of religious studies and chair of religious studies at Pomona College. Um, we teach a class called Religion, Ethics, and Social Practice that has a community-engaged uh, component. Um, due to COVID, I'm actually caught in Canada because I was visiting my parents. So I am now, uh, at the moment, uh, on uh, what was traditionally Blackfoot and uh, Stony land. And, uh, you know, uh, when I was a young student in Canada as an undergraduate, I actually had a summer uh, job where I was working on slave territory. So the slave Indians are just north of us, uh, north of Edmonton, actually. And uh, I worked alongside some uh, people, uh, some slave Indians. And so it was uh, sort of sparked a lifelong kind of interest in um, indigenous peoples. Um, so I really welcome this opportunity to continue to further my education. I've always felt a terrible, uh, huge oversight on the part of the Claremont Colleges that we don't actually have a Native Studies major, even though I know that there's people working towards that. In Religious Studies, we don't have, uh, except for one course uh, offered at Pitzer, I believe, uh, we don't have courses on uh, indigenous religious traditions, which just seems to me like such a huge oversight. So I'm really grateful to be here and thank you, Julia, for you know leading us in this and Violet for putting this together and everyone else, so. Thank you. And it, it was Zane? Pleasure to have you, Zane. It's like Zane, uh, Jane, but with a Z. Zane, <laughs> Yeah. pleasure. And uh, Linda, hi, Linda. Are you with us? Yes, I am. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, I'm Linda Lam. I'm the director for the Center for Asian Pacific American Students at Pitzer College. Um, I'm on Tongva land um, in the area of uh, Hutnaga, which was the, uh, means the place of the willow. Um, and I'm here because it's Julia and Violet. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I think that, and, and also, yeah, to hear about, you know, what um, in this moment in terms of pandemic and healing, you know, how, how can we look at, um, how can we do that in community? And, um, yeah, and also just to be in community with everyone here tonight, too. I think it's important. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. And thank you for the comment on community and solidarity right now. That's so healing, you know, just coming together. So we're happy you're here. And uh, let's see. Florence, is uh, Florence, are hi. you with Florence? Yeah, I'm here. Um, hi, I'm Florence, I'm a student at Scripps. I'm from San Francisco. And the reason why I'm here today is because I never really had the opportunity to learn more about indigenous people and their experiences. So yeah, that's why I'm here. 
awesome. Thanks for joining us, Florence. Glad you're here. And Tiffany, you are to the right of Florence. Hi, Tiffany. Hi, um, I'm Tiffany. I go to Pomona College and I'm studying neuroscience. And I'm here, oh, and also I'm currently in the Bay Area. I'm hosted on Ohlone land. Um, and I am hoping to, um, like Linda said, just sort of contextualize the pandemic um, and learn more about like indigenous um, narratives and the ways of dealing with pre like past pandemics. Um, and yeah, also be in community with everybody here. Thanks. Thank you, Tiffany. And uh, Isabella, Isabella Garcia, are you here with us? Yes, hi. Um, I'm Isabella, I'm a student at Pitzer and I'm here today because I've been learning more about indigenous people in my classes and, uh, oh, and I'm from LA area on Tongva land. So um, I'm just really interested in learning about indigenous perspectives and kind of like what Paula said about the uh, Western perspectives versus indigenous perspectives and just more about like um, healing during this tough time. So, yeah. Thank you for being here. Happy you're here. And is it Aditi? Am I saying that right? Yeah, it's a DT. Hi, a DT. Hi, um, I'm a student at Pitzer College. Um, I had the privilege of taking political sociology um, with Professor uh, Stainman and um, took basically read um, our history is the future and um, more about like uh, Standing Rock and uh, no, uh, you know, D Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and this summer I've been actually working uh, for an indigenous um, Latina um, like political candidate. Her name is Jackie Fielder um, in, in San Francisco Bay Area. Um, she is from the Lakota tribe. Um, and just also with uh, the like wildfires happening and just how important um, indigenous like practices were to ecological landscapes. Um, learning more about that and also uh, forms of like healing and um, resistance just to echo what uh, others have said as well. Thank you. And is that a background or are you uh, sitting behind a beautiful redwood right now? Um, no, it's a fence, but. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> I got excited. <laughs> I know. I hope all the redwoods aren't, um, you know, they're not killed off by the fires. So unfortunately in Santa Cruz, I'm not sure which native indigenous lands are on those or East Bay as well. But I know Bay Area is, I'm actually from the town of, small town of Los Altos and Los, the Los Altos Hills was um, a lonely land. So, yeah. Mm. Have to text the, the area code there and find out, but thank you, sister. Appreciate that and your words. And all right, um, Anam. Are you with us, Anam? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Anam. I'm a senior at Pomona. Um, I'm on Mohican land right now in Albany, New York. Um, I'm just here uh, to learn and to, um, I think something I've been thinking about in the pandemic is about care systems and care for the land. And then what does that look like in indigenous context? And yeah, I'm just here to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Anam. Welcome. And Trami, Trami, are you here? Yes, I am. Hi, everyone. My name is Trami, and I am a junior at Pomona College. Um, today, I'm here to kind of expand my knowledge of just Indigenous learning and loving, um, because I spent some time with that last semester. Would you mind speaking up a little bit, sister? I, I don't have the loudest audio here. No worries. So I'm here to share space. Um, and to hear the stories and immerse myself in this experience with everyone. So thank you for having me. Appreciate that. Glad to have you. And I think that's, uh, that looks like, oh, um, is that, did we get Tiffany? 
think Tiffany might have popped in. Hi, Tiffany. Are you with us, Tiffany Chen? Oh, hi. I already introduced myself. Oh, all right. That was my bad. Okay, then I think good. Wow. Good evening. So we're going to talk about how these women got started, right? Started with my grandma. <laughs> so um, my grandma died when I, when I was two years old, but she enrolled me. So I have a BIA number so I can use Indian Health and um, some I have some perks, right? But I always say she must have been an activist because um, my brothers and sisters aren't enrolled. They're four years younger than me. So, so I started doing everything for her. And then this year I decided, I turned 72 and I decided, uh oh, I think I kind of like outlived her, her space and I need to do everything for my great granddaughter, which is the reason why I have um, a website at Pitzer to be visible.org. So that's some place you might want to go if you want to know history or want to know anything about me. Uh, we, st we did Tongo Women Inspiring the Future. And here, Marissa's only like, I don't know if they can see it. She's like 11. And she asked me one summer break, one spring break, she said, Nana, how does it feel to be a Tongva woman? And I said, I feel invisible. 40 years I've been teaching about the Tongva and people still don't know. So, uh, one thing that the pandemic has done is that history is going out everywhere now. <laughs> I, I tend to be teaching more and more history and uh, through Zoom, right? <laughs> Learning to Zoom at my age and, and doing this uh, is really powerful. But Marissa is now 15 and she is definitely the future. Uh, this is Alana, her little sister next to her. She's still, she's 11 now, but this is my grandma, Julia. And of course she looks just like me, right? We can be twins. <laughs> and so my grandma was really dear to me. I just kind of, I just kind of knew she wanted me to be here on this earth. I didn't know a whole lot about uh, her. I that was only two, but I heard the stories. So I, I think I'd like to start, so we're gonna talk about these women, but I'd like to start with the first woman chief, which was um, Victoria Reed. Victoria Reed um, was born at the first Mission San Gabriel, which was in Whittier. And we used to laugh at the, at the people because they kept building this mission and it, it flooded five times. And then the sixth time there was an earthquake. And so her older brother dies there and she becomes the first woman chief at Mission San Gabriel. So in um, my website, I have the letters of Hugo Reed that um, talks about all our culture and everything there is about us. Because she, so I call her a woman with the first prenup because she teaches, she says, I'll marry you if you keep my tribe alive. So she's also, um, her father, her nickname, because we didn't give our people names until they went to pre-beauty ceremonies. So first she was called Manaset, which means uh, older daughter. And then her father starts training her to become the, the chief at age 12. And she, and he names her Wild Rose. Then she, but they, the father, decided, it was really close to the priest at San Gabriel, and he decided that he would ask the priest if he could name her Batalomia. So we know the story of Batalome de las Casas, who was a priest who came to take care of, get rid of all the Indians, but changed his mind. Well, her, she's the only woman to be Batalomia, because she asked to be, uh, the father asked for her to carry his name in baptism. And then Hugo, so Hugo Reed, the Scotchman, comes and he wants property here in California. So he decides to um, give up his citizenship as a Scottish man and becomes a Mexican to receive property. So 
and Victoria, of course, um, marries him, and he names her <laughs> Victoria Reed uh, because he was in love with Queen Victoria. So I always say when I do something about uh, about Victoria, I call her Bartholomea, a wild rose, because we wouldn't have went for that, <laughs> you know. But she's a powerful woman. She speaks five languages. Um, she knew how to read and write, but she only wrote two letters in her lifetime because she said it only took the stroke of a pen to get rid of the tribe. So she writes one letter when her husband is sick and is in San Francisco, and then another one um, that she writes to the governor. And those are the only two letters she wrote in her lifetime. Also, when the, when the Spanish women came, she's in a book called Spanish and Lace that uh, she teaches proper etic California etiquette to the Spanish women who come later on. So that's Victoria. Um, so I wrote about these women that inspired me about who they were, right? And didn't even pay attention to the end that all of them were daughters of chiefs. They were women that were, we always say that in the tribe, we we're born into whoever we're supposed to become. And so that's why we don't have teenage problems because we already know as we're growing up, there's elders watching us. There's people kind of guiding you in your steps for your future. So, um, so then we have the, the other powerful woman, I don't have her name, but she uh, delivered water door to door in Los Angeles from the LA River. Um, and she delivers that water to the first 10 black families in Los Angeles that live down in Yonda, which is, is Los Angeles for us. But um, she was, uh, she's an older woman. So I kind of got some pictures of her as an older woman. She's the first woman to work for the Department of Water and Power. And she looks like she's in her 60s. They do have a statue of her on Avenue 26, but she looks like 26. <laughs> so they turn the age around. And this summer, Marissa really was inspired to do a, a picture of her in, in solidarity of, of caring for water and the, and the power of water and what water is. And so I thought that was really awesome that she would pick the water woman of all women, right? But she saw her as a, a, as a leader because um, women today are still working and, and, and taking the tribe further up. And it's just like really important to know these women. Then we have uh, Juana Maria, which is from most of you. If, you. if you went to school in California and some places outside of California, no Island of the Blue Dolphin, which was a um, novel, right? It was a, a, it was a, they got a fantasy story about this woman that grew up in, um, lived on the island of uh, San Nicholas for 18 years by herself and she was supposed to be like Robin Hood they kept trying to take when they were writing about her they kept wanting to make her a boy right because boys are the leaders <laughs> but they wanted up with Juana Maria and now we have her true story and it said uh, they have the true video of her also uh, and they found like when she was taken to the wrong mission when they picked her up at San Nicolas Island, she was taken to Santa Barbara and that's where she's buried. But there's uh, six interpreters that were Tongva that talked to her. So they acknowledge them all as Tongva and they had this true story. But the, the great thing about that that was exciting to me was that Scott O'Dell, who wrote the book about Island of the Blue Dolphin, lived downtown in, in, in Claremont in the village and he took the he took his books to the women's college that's up in the hills close by us by Claremont by Pitcher. as we had those ladies come work at the mural at the those students come work on the mural and it's a school right there in Claremont and that's where he sold his first books of Juana Maria um, and um and now her true story come out and I thought that was it was about the time that I was writing my book and I thought, oh, that's so awesome that here we are in Claremont rewriting the same history, right? And it's powerful. Um, 
So because like eight years ago, I decided that I needed to start teaching with that historical wisdom of my ancestors, not just teaching uh, from what I learned, but really going to them and finding out what it is I'm supposed to be and who I'm supposed to be. So uh, I think that's important to us. And sometimes we need to look back at those people that raised us that were really instrumental in our lives, people we know. So a long time ago, you used to take like five people to make a person make it in life. Today, it only takes one person. So it's like, so we have so many uh, people we can, and so my grandma's name, of course, is Julia, so I'm Julia. <laughs> so that's really powerful. I do have a granddaughter named Julia and a great granddaughter named Julia. <laughs> so then we have Toy Purina. Toy Purina is, um, was a revolutionist. Um, she, and, and it's not like none of, so Victoria Reed wanted to be like Toy Purina, right? She wanted to go fight for her people, but her father said, you're, you're to become the chief. So you need to be a loving person to protect your people. You can't be fighting. So there's different ways that we fight, right? So I have, without even noticing, um, a lot of people are really acknowledging the Tongva as that invisibility. And they are definitely trying to make me visible out there. I can feel it, <laughs> right? So it's like, it's important to be visible. And when we, open, when we opened the website, there was nobody with that name to be, when we named it to be visible. And now there's a lot of things out there. And a lot of people are using the word. But it is an invisibility that we, that we deal with as not only women, but as, yes, people of different colors, people from different areas, we all deal with that invisibility in some way. So for me, it's about how do we connect? How do we connect? How do we find those likenesses? And that's by knowing who we are. Because when we know who we are, we can empower other people because we are not scared that they're going to take a piece of, a piece of the pie right, that we talk about. We talk about that apple pie. We're going to take a piece. Of, we're not going to take a piece of pie. We're going to have more pie because we're going to have more to share because we're going to talk about um, our likenesses and not our differences and how do we empower each other as women. Um, and we empower our men also. We, we don't choose to be above men. We choose to empower them to, to walk the road that they're supposed to walk. And so, and I always say women just heal faster because we just, I, I don't know if it's because we, we can have babies or just because we just, <laughs> we can take the pain or we can heal, heal with it. We still have to take care of family no matter what's going on with us, right? And, um, and all destruction that has happened around the world has always happened with taking the women, killing the children. And so it's a way to break a man's spirit. So we as women have totally need to empower. And through this pandemic, it's been ex really something because this summer um, I found out that I thought, why did I get so sick this summer? I've never had air conditioning, right? Because this is the first summer I've been home 24 seven. And I thought, that's it, right? And once I figured it out, then I could say, okay, now I have to deal with it. And it makes us stronger, not weaker. But sometimes, you know, because I don't know, we, we had might have had air conditioner as kids, but it is getting hotter these days. Um, I think the other woman in here, we have Victoria. And, my, and I worked with this with my students. And I told them, I just told them a little bit about the story. And I said, but I want silhouettes, because so, I want every girl to see it to imagine herself in that place. But what happened was um, the first school I went to, 20 boys bought the book. And I thought, <laughs> how cute. They took pictures with me. But how cute that the boys would want the book. So then uh, there's a tar pit woman, the first human being that they find at the tar pits in Los Angeles, right? 
and she had a, uh, they had hit her like with a two by four on the head, so she had this gash in her head, and they used to have her up in the museum, but a couple of, a few years back, they took her down, because they kind of figured out maybe it was insulting us. <laughs> So it took them a long time to decide that. But somebody had done a reconstruction picture of her. And I got the picture. Um, I have a picture of what they thought she might have looked like. And I went to laminate it. And my daughter said, why does Erica, my granddaughter, have all these polka dots on her face? And I said, that's not my granddaughter. That, that's that's uh, the tar pit woman. And it shows the strength that we have in our, in our DNAs that we continue to be strong women, always being strong for our families, for um, through whatever we're going through, right? It doesn't mean that, um, I always say, you know, I, I do a lot of speaking on missing women and that's what the mural, new mural is gonna be about these twin sisters and they're not in my book, but, I think a couple of years ago, some of the students did a story for me, but it was, it's about Sister Moon and Sister no, no Moon, and they were born, they were born to a chief during an eclipse in Pacific Palisades, and they were, um, one of them kind of, you know, at age 10, you decided to kind of go off and kind of want to look at the flowers by yourself and not with your sister, so she went to gather some chia on the hill and she, and she fell off the cliff in Pacific Palisades. And then her sister couldn't find her and she was really upset and she was getting sicker and sicker. And the creator told her, you can either join her or you're gonna get sicker and join her anyways. And so she decided to, to jump off the cliff. And so she went off the cliff and the next morning, all the elders came to the, um, to that part of the, where the uh, the ground where the cliff was, and that's the first time we ever find that shell. It looks like a cone, and it has two little lines. And when we do the when we do the the mural, everyone will be able to make a necklace out of that shell because it has two lines around the cone, showing that we're always supposed to be together. Never should we be alone out there. So when I tell people that we're fighting for missing women. I say, how many of your cousins, of your sisters, of your relatives have you called today? Or yes, your friends. So sometimes we shouldn't be in the march. We should be taking care of the people that we love. And we just kind of forget that when we get so involved in being in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the modern way that we've been taught to fight, right? And sometimes we need to fight from that love inside of us and, and remember how we were taught that protection comes from one another to each other. So um, I was thinking, anybody have questions? So did you put my website on there? They can look in there, they can ask me questions, send me questions or yes. tell me what they wanna do. <laughs> uh, we have uh, Julia's website in the chat if you wanna click on that, that'll take you to her website. And we also have the link for the book that she's referencing. And if anyone has any questions, we will open it up to Q&A. Or maybe they wanna chat it to you. <laughs> sure, you can drop it in the chat or you can just um, feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand. Ah, okay. Nancy. Oh, Asusa, we didn't yes. forget her. So Asusa. Asusa is another woman in my book, and it took me 40 years to find her story. <laughs> um, there's a, there was an Asusa revival on a little street in Asusa in LA, and in, and in No Tokyo, there's a sign giving her knowledge of Asusa, right, of the Asusa revival. But when Reverend Seymour came from the South to do a three-day revival, wound ended up doing one ended up dying in Los Angeles, but did a full year revival where people were actually, there's a lot of books out there growing limbs and, and going to the Body Bray House by um, Echo Park for, to get for recovery of whatever they might have been on. But Asusa was 
the healer for the Tangba. And all I had found in every book of Reverend Seymour's is where I started was that Father Crispy uh, saw her heal a chief by laying hands on her, on, on the chief. So as soon as the, uh, so he said that the time before the Pentecostal movement came to Los Angeles, we already had a healer named Azusa. And so like maybe five years ago, I was, I was teaching downtown in LA at a museum. And this guy came from the high desert and he came in and he says, my ancestor slapped me this morning and said, come see you. But I don't know why. And I said, okay, so he buys my book and he gets to the Sousa page <laughs> and he says, that's why I'm here. He brought me the true story of Asusa. And so her Asusa means blessed miracle. Of course it means skunk sometimes and it means like grandma, you know. So, um, but the book is called, uh, the Talisa Lo pamphlet book and it's called Blessed Miracle. So that was, connecting her that that was the truth and then they had a necessary revival downtown la and, and a lot of um a lot of people kind of felt like she was just passing me the torch and i was supposed to just go on and run with it right <laughs> so I'm, I'm out there at the coliseum at the la coliseum and there's ten thousand people and i'm opening the blessing with the blessing and i'm saying well let the heavens just burst and it started pouring rain and I thought, oops, <laughs> I better watch what I say. <laughs> Cause here we are in a Coliseum pouring rain on us. But on a card that we passed out to the people, it said, if you want healing, go to Asusa. So about 10 years ago, I was at, uh, doing a summer program at uh, Pitzer and there was a young lady from, um, from the Zuni tribe was one of our mentors. And I said, you know, I've only, I, I, I can't find her story, but I know this woman, Asusa, exists because she came to me in my dreams. And he, she says, oh, my uncles talk about Asusa and that everybody went to Asusa in, El, in Los Angeles. So that was really cool. But when I finally found the book, that was just, that just connected it because some people want to see the writing, right? <laughs> they want to see, because I kept asking people and they said, oh, you know, people make up stories about us. And I said, no, they don't. Otherwise she would be coming to my, me in my dream. So I had been sick for like 10 months in the bed uh, from the nerves in my feet and I couldn't get on them. And Asusa, and I was uh, dreaming and Asusa came to me and I was at Thousand Oaks. I had been there one time to the park and I was at a picnic table praying for people. And Azusa put her, said, you have to keep going. And I said, I'm tired, I can't go no more. And then she came again later on, you know, cause when you're home stuck in a bed, you're watching all kinds of junk on TV, <laughs> all these shows and stuff. And she came to me again and she says, you have to keep going. So the third time she came, I actually felt her hand on my shoulder. So I called the paramedics and went to the hospital and they told me, here's the volume, go home. I said, that's gonna make me walk. <laughs> you know, it didn't, but I thought, you just gonna give me this little pill, it's gonna make me walk, you know? But it's like, it was just really powerful. And, and every time um, that I think about her, and I felt her and I went back after I got well the last couple of years and taking pictures of those places where I saw her in my dream. So it's been, so Susa is really uh, an important person to me because she, you know, when I tell people about her, they say she don't exist. She has to exist if she comes to me in my dream. <laughs> so I hope that helps Nancy. <laughs> All right, any other, any other questions for Julia? Drop them in the chat. Feel free to raise your hand. You're thinking. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm happy to, I have tons of questions, but I'll, I'll just start. <laughs> uh, one of the most powerful exercises that you've done with us in the Native Youth to College program at Pitzer uh, was having us find our rock. And oh. 
I really like what you said about um, the elders guiding you and, and watching you. And uh, to me, that's, that's my strength is my, my elders and um, my grandparents. And I'm just curious, you kind of answered my question with the story about Azusa and the dream, but uh, Auntie, what's your rock? What keeps you, uh, what keeps you going? How do you have the courage and, and just this uh, tour de force of energy to do all that you do? I think because of all the young people, they keep calling me. So this semester, I have students at Pitcher. I have five students from Cal State LA that are doing the history. I have um, students from UCLA. Yes, students, and I and I have a circle with uh, Redlands University also. Uh, the fact that that young people want the knowledge, they want to, you know, and that you can inspire them. And I always tell my students, you know, not only do I inspire you, but you inspire me because I see you doing the work. And, and it's really important, you know, to inspire each other, that we're never above anybody. We're always inspiring each other as we work together. And, and I had my hand statue here that are made with the artist. <laughs> with Nancy. And uh, while people formulate their, their questions here, I want to make sure everyone has time to ask a question if they want to. But um, I, I can just uh, riff on that and second that about uh, the intergenerational collaboration and just having that intergenerational communication with the the mentors mentoring the younger students, you know, the little ones, and then the elders mentoring kind of the, the young adults. And just, I can't say how healing, uh, speaking of healing and coping mechanisms, uh, what, what Auntie says is really true. I mean, having that uh, community of belongingness, you can say, or community of care, but that intergenerational component is, is so critical. And um, I didn't mention it earlier, but uh, Nancy Mincy is also one of my uh, mentors who really helped guide me in high school with the Teen Green program that's still running today. Um, and we'll, we'll drop a link to that. And if you ever want to be a mentor and kind of continue on, um, finding a mentor can be a really good healing strategy, but also finding a student to mentor uh, can be a really beautiful coping strategy as well. And so I encourage all of you to, to think about those intergenerational connections that, that we're building here and the opportunities that we have of why we came together today. Uh, so I just wanna thank you for saying that, Auntie. So I wanted to say that, uh, you know, when we talk about elders, the elders are not just old people. <laughs> so I tell my great granddaughter, Marissa, who's 15, uh, this summer she joined us uh, art work uh, workshop. And, and, the, and the students, she was only 15 year old, she's always a baby, right? <laughs> and everybody else was 18 to 24. And they were talking and they were sharing. She said, today we spent the day talking about you, Nana. And I said, because if you learn and you can teach somebody else, then, then you're an elder too. Being an elder is sharing your knowledge. It's not about keeping it. Or it's not about saying, um, just being um, privileged by saying, give me this and give me that because I'm old. <laughs> it's about what we give to the community. Thank you, Auntie. Any other? No, I'm sure they're they're coming up there. I'm sure they're bubbling up. I have a question. Um, um, let me turn on my video. <laughs> Hi. Nancy Julia, Hi. Thank you so much for sharing. I apologize. While you were talking, I've been just cooking dinner for my family. It's okay. <laughs> I'm really appreciating the fact that we're talking about what healing looks like. My question to you, um, Auntie Julia, is when you think about um, exactly what you said about elders and the difference between like um, age versus sharing, is, mm -hmm. there, is there a Tongva word or um, 
I guess the word that that embodies that outside of elder because I I also have been thinking a lot about that word elder and where that comes from and how that may create a certain kind of frame of thinking but as you're talking about what elder really is it's about sharing what you have and sharing it from be from not necessarily from what you're learning in a book but learning from like older ways right um, yeah that's my question so i'm thinking uh so the the word for uh el for grandma right in tangwa is suk but isn't that like seek like seek that knowledge, right? And when we seek the knowledge that we need for whatever it is, that's what empowers us. Because once we start seeking, those people will come into our lives, right? And, and we might be waiting for somebody older to come and it might be a child who says the words you were looking for. Yeah. So I, I think, what was it? Um, my my granddaughter my husband has uh dementia and she was saying um oh nana don't be um like restless or get upset because god picks strong people to deal with things and isn't that how we deal how we how we work if we don't work through something we can't share how to work with something ourselves we have to go through it and and, and i thought uh, I'm thinking she was 13, I'm thinking, get for real. <laughs> you know? But I'm not gonna tell her that, but I'm thinking, but she said, God picks strong people to deal. And, and that's the truth. And sometimes the words come out of, out of the babes, right? To empower us. And we just gotta be, have that open ear and, and, that, and seek that wisdom, right? So. She goes. <laughs> Did that help? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> um, you've talked so much about your, you know, your ancestors, but also your daughter and your granddaughters and your grandchildren, um, your great grandchildren, even. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of them. Um, and I'm just thinking in terms of the people in my life, like I know my mother is retired and she moved to Portland to be closer to the grandkids where my brother's family is. And this time has been so hard for her because it's sort of like cut a lot of that um, intimacy off uh, because the kids are in a, a group bubble for school and my mother is very high risk. And I'm just wondering how, if you're willing to share um, advice or strategies or where you look for console when you're trying um, to, to kind of navigate these new restrictions. Um, I, I, I call them kind of, you know, they're all home schooling right now, <laughs> but um, I, I, I take the time to call them and see how they're doing. So like Alana, she's 12. I call her the teeny bopper. <laughs> and, and I just make sure, even if I just can wave at them somewhere, you know, when I go by their house and I don't go in and see them or stuff, that, that, I, that I let them know that I'm there. That is important. It's, it's, it's a hard time, but it's also like we, um, so when this first happened, my, my Marissa was really pretty upset about this is the first time this has ever happened. And so what I did was I went and got a lot of material for her to show her all the things that we've gone through as people. Maybe we weren't living in that era, but we've all gone through something. And so we have to remember that we survived because we were empowered to do it. So, you know, uh, contact is really hard. <laughs> right so like i i find myself so but i still read and um and i have i i've been blessed because i probably have more work than i did when i was out there running around when i was a younger woman <laughs> yeah but i get to share my moments with them and they get to share what they're going to so thank you so but I do have my hand with my little circle. <laughs> I moved it the other day because I said, I wanted it to melt with all this heat. <laughs> it didn't. So that made me think I can't complain. If, that, if it would have melted, I could complain. <laughs> my hand melted. <laughs> so. 
sound. I'm glad you're feeling better. Thank you. It's so exciting to be here. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, Sarah, we're really happy that you were able to make it and join us today and that you're healing. Uh -huh. so. Violet, I'm just realizing that you were the person I must have been emailing with about the Native Youth to College program. <laughs> it, it, it occurred to me. It was clicking as well. I was, it took a while. I was a little slow, oh. but ha I, yes, it's good to finally meet you. Yeah, it's really good. Absolutely, at least. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had kind of like a comment slash question. Okay. Um, thank you so much, by the way, for uh, taking your time to speak to us and share your wisdom. Um, on the topic of intergenerational, um, like relationship building and strength, um, I'm, I'm currently doing the CASA program, which is the Ontario program, which is critical action and social advocacy. And one of our assignments is a personal healing praxis. And I decided I wanted to um, work on my language because I, I used to be able to speak my native language, but um, my kindergarten teacher told my mom that I can't understand your kid. So she had to switch to English and English became the dominant language. Um, and I, I hoping that in this process it, um, of like relearning my language, it will be like reaffirming. But I, I guess, um, how do you see um, like traditions and language um, from more like marginalized communities? And obviously I, I know like with respect, I, I'm like the other Indian. <laughs> I don't know what Christopher Columbus was thinking when he, <laughs> he, he thought he was on India land, but yeah, that was the other Indian. Um, but how do you kind of see, I guess, um, like language um, being like a critical aspect of um, reconciling like uh, marginalized communities and um, kind of like shifting the dominant narrative? Well, I think, so for me, uh, I always like to recommend that the, there's a video called My Spirit Does Not Speak English. And so uh, Marissa, Marissa knows Tongva, some Tongva, right? But I don't get to teach her a lot. But they've all learned Spanish in school. And so this week she told me, Nana, from now on, I'm speaking to you in Spanish every time I see you. <laughs> and she goes in the store speaking in Spanish <laughs> because she says, I have to use it, right? So I'm, I'm Tongva and a Hachiman on my mother's side and my Azteca and Spaniard on my on my dad's side. But I learned Spanish in Tijuana when my stepbrothers and sisters were good. I went to school there three years. So it's important to um, to know those languages. It's what helps you in life, right? And so it's for for me as an older person, so I, I know how to write our words, I know how to read them, I know how to make games and stuff for the kids to learn. But it's uh, it's harder to pick up but they are picking it up really simple really easy and it's really exciting to hear them and and to hear none of my children spoke spanish because the same reason they didn't sound right <laughs> and and none of my and my grandchildren i think i only have two out of the 12 to speak spanish but the great grands all of them speak spanish because they and they're taking it in school and and so it's been it's been great that that they've done that because to them, it's powerful to know that other language. But I, I told this lady I was doing an opening for a, a school program, and she had been trying to um, get pregnant for a long time. And, it, and I said, did you try talking to God in your language? If you speak to God from the language he gave you, and you're, try it. Because I, it's not that God doesn't hear us in English, is that we need to connect to our spirits. And our spirit is that language that we know. Thank you so much for um, the advice on my language journey. I'm really excited now. <laughs> Great. And uh, there's actually a, 
a Scripps student, um, many of you may know Carol Ann Duro. Uh, she is uh, Serrano from the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. And I think she has a whole Discord server happening uh, right now on indigenous language revitalization. Um, so that she would be a, a great colleague to connect with. And uh, if you're interested in that, kind of want community. And thankfully, uh, we were able to drop the book Julia was mentioning and the documentary in the chat and some of the information on the whole earth building as well. And we have time for one or two more questions before uh, we'll drop a link to how you can learn more about the mural project and also uh, protecting the Etiwanda sage fields right now if you're interested in environmental activism. And if you're an artist, ways that you can tune into our next workshop, which we'll be more focusing on mural making and we'll actually get into some technical detail on art making and the history of art for social movements, um, particularly with the anarchist movement and other types of marginalized political movements. But we do have time for one or two more questions. If anyone has any burning uh, questions that they, they really want to take the time to get answered. We're shy. <laughs> um, Violet? Yes. Um, this, is, this is Nancy. And um, I just wanted to thank you for putting this program together and to tell you that I actually submitted an article about you today uh, for our upcoming newsletter. And we're featuring the young people that have been associated with our program who are inspiring us today. And I chose you as one of them because you are one of the people that really is giving me the inspiration that I need to continue to do my work. And I feel so blessed to know you and to be able to uh, be in conversation with you about uh, the wonderful, all of the wonderful work that you and your colleagues are doing. So I just wanted to acknowledge that um, tonight and to thank you um, for, for all that you're doing and for, for being you. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, I think that um, Really what, what tonight is about is uh, finding those healing modalities. And I think that in the space of academia or in the city you grew up in or in the school you go to, so much of uh, the Western world has beginnings and endings, clear starts and finishes, where you start, where you end, where the other person starts and ends. And it's just so disjointed and one of the, the lessons I learned from you, Nancy, and from you, uh, Auntie, and from you, Trisha, and everyone at Pitzer, Eric, and, and Linda, and everyone that I've worked with, <clears throat> is that um, it really is about lifelong learning, and these things don't end. Uh, some of the projects that I was fortunate enough to start in high school are blossoming forward, and who knows how many other youth in, in Teen Green are going to pick up the torch and who knows how many of you are going to start your own groups or your own projects that maybe 10 years down the road will be able to support and be a part of. And so um, I think in some ways that's why it's so challenging to say what my role has been at Pitzer and my role is here uh, because it, it really is a lifelong role and, and commitment to the community and my elders. and. Um, and it's something that is healing and that I, I think that we're highlighting today is how community connection and community work, it, it's not work, it's, it's, um, it truly is an act of love and it, it will give back more, just like a, a fruit, it will bear more fruit than you ever imagined from that one seed. And so um, thank you for planting those seeds in me, Nancy and, and Auntie and uh, everyone here for watering them. And, and nourishing the community and Pitzer College for taking that stand to honor and recognize our native elders and the contributions that 
um, Native people have made that we all benefit from today. Uh, so I, I really appreciate you saying that, Nancy. And it's 7.15, uh, so if anyone has any lingering questions, uh, you're welcome to answer them. And we also dropped in a link so you can stay in touch and just join the project or share what you're doing and uh, we can all support each other. Yes. All right. So okay. it looks like there's there's no more questions. I'll I'll let you uh, close things off, Auntie. Okay. Well, I I'm so grateful for all of you, and and I'm I'm glad I you know there were some new students, but a lot of people that I know, and I I'm really thankful for all of you because all of you make. I always say we can't give more than we receive, and giving is is I always say it's it's. Uh, can be pretty selfish because the more we give, the more we receive, right? So even when we're really down, somebody has something good to say. And I think that's really important. Thank you. Thank you, Auntie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome.